Okay, so I think we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, this is the Debian Installer Skills Exchange. Um, Joey Hess is, uh, I guess, moderating it. Uh, and if you have questions or suggestions or whatever, raise your hand. I'll try to run a microphone to you. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we, I really only put this on the schedule because a couple of people came to me and said, you know, we're starting to work on DI and we would need, you know, detailed help on various areas. And uh, if people here are interested in just getting started, we can, you know, start at the very beginning or we can dive into whatever particular details people want to learn about. So uh, it's really up to you all. <laughs> I don't have any particular demos prepared or anything like that. I just wanted to, you know, simple school exchange. So, uh, and I would also like to invite people in the back to move up front if you uh, want to participate because it's, you know, it's a small room, but get up here near the front and we can all talk together easier. Serena? <laughs> Um, if, if no one else is going to state any preferences, I'd be happy to hear something sort of more starting towards the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I'm not even sure like how I would begin working with DI. It doesn't follow. It doesn't seem to follow the same uh, packaging workflow that I'm used to for modifying other Debian packages. But maybe I just am missing well, a step. It basically does because you're you have source packages that build UDEBs which are, you know, like devs, and they're all in Git, and uh, basically your workflow is the same. You don't have um, patches going on because they're all native packages. All, well, most of them are all native, except for things like BusyBox. Um, so, I mean, you can start, I think probably the place that most people would get started would be to take a checkout of DI, which is a bit of a complicated process because we have, you know, several hundred packages in Git. And there is this one um, simple command line here, which actually will pull down everything. Well, you might have to escape this guy here. Does that show up? Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can make that show up. Uh, anyway, there's a command line, which you now can't see. And if you cut and paste that, it will start checking things out like it's doing here. And you'll get a DI tree eventually. Um, DI tree is fairly simple. You have your packages directory, which has the lion's share of packages that are in DI. Um, you have this other directory installer, which is the, um, can you see this? Good. Yep. Okay, which is the uh, Debian installer source package, which actually builds the installation images. And um, basically working on DI as a matter of finding the right UDEB and modifying it, you know. So I've been trying to build the installer recently, and one thing you have to know is that when you try to build the installer, it has some funky uh, detection mechanism to either take UDEBs from testing or unstable, yeah. even yeah. even if you build to unstable. And it has been discussed last year by the release team in Otavio. Uh, about how it should be done uh, in an ideal world. But nowadays, if you build for unstable, you're taking UDEBs from testing, which can be quite confusing. Uh, but all in all, the building process is quite easy, and hacking on this, even this installer yeah. part, is just a matter of various make files and other things. I'm, I mean, I just changed the images for the SysLinux boots splash screens and I mean it's just a matter of finding the new f the correct files, committing it into Git, trying to build in some clean shoot and then you have images. And then you can just boot them using Kimu or whatever and it just works. Yeah. The or, or not. <laughs> well, it just works. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't my normal development machine, it's just a random machine that I have available since my laptop's dead. Um, but yeah, um, wow that's a fun error. Um, the only tricky thing about building DI yourself is you do have to put in the modified UDEBs that you want to use. If you haven't released them and you're, you know, in a development rebuild test cycle, you have to put them in the right place in here. It's all documented or you, we can show how to do it, but you do have to learn a few tricks to get it going. Wookie. So I guess, um, the thing I found when I tried hacking on this is if you just check out the DI stuff, it's just this kind of 
tree of metadata rather than any actual program. And ah, you kind of look at it going, right. what, do I, what do I change where <laughs> to actually change something? You know, I right. can copy another one, but I have no clue what I'm doing. And, and so a little bit of that yeah, might be um, helpful. If you, for example, you go into a random package, maybe that's not a good one. Maybe you were thinking about something like, um, oh, I don't know. What? No. A random package that's not insane. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you might go into a package and see, oh, there's one whole file in the source package, and then the important stuff tends to be tucked away in here. We have a uh, templates file, you know, standard DevConf templates. We have, um, you know, a post inst, which is what gets run when the when the udeb is selected in the main menu, or when it's automatically selected at runtime, and all this does is calls another piece of DI. Uh, <laughs> so that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, DI, um, um, probably 90% of the interesting stuff does live in the uh, packages control metadata. Um, do we have an easy way to run some sort of DI root besides just launching a Kimu, going to console right. stuff? There's a way to do that, but you can't use it to do very much. Um, if you go in here to where I failed to build a minute ago, you can run, um, I think it's demo underscore image name, so demo underscore netboot, and it'll start up the DI menu, but you probably don't want to run very much in it because you'll eventually nuke your drive or it'll just fail to work. <laughs> so everybody tests it in QMU or in VirtualBox. Because like for me, that demo would be awesome if I can connect a loopback Mm -hmm. uh, hard drives or like hard drives as a files yeah. to quickly automatically test stuff for Parkman. Yeah, yeah. I can s trying to get to where you want to test is one of the annoying things about DI for sure. And I'll tell you personally, my dirty little secret is when I'm working on DI, I'll build something that I think sh might work, boot up the image, find out it doesn't work. And then I'll go in and edit the post dense manually until it works. And you know, there's the third console which has the debug log, so you can pretty much see how it's failing. Get a post dense that kind of works, and then I'll put, pull it back out, and you know, massage that into something I can commit. Uh, like I mean, in theory, it's possible to use cdebconf on your system and just uh, yeah. oh. run a random uh, yeah. udep from it, but um, like with netconf, it might just uh, screw your system if you aren't careful. Yeah. And I think one thing that we could do better along those lines is to use the live installer stuff, which actually can boot, can run DI in a CH root and actually do useful things because it's what's used on the live, um, you know, the live CDs. We could use that maybe better, but nobody's really used it that way. Um, also, something else that might be useful is you can run Debian installer in LXC as well now. In and what? In LXC. Oh, in it's a container? Yeah, in a container. Oh, okay. The, my flatmate does a lot of Debian installer work, and he does it all in uh, in LXC, and it just works fine. That would be a good thing to document how to do. Yeah, apart from he said he doesn't do anything with disks such that it doesn't complete the installation. Yeah, well, or it doesn't have to yeah. run all the way through for but some it, things. But if I want to work on part, and right. <laughs> just I do want to partition the hard right. disk. So, yeah, that's me. One option for you, if you want to work on Parkman, is to just have a pre-seed file that goes until Parkman starts. Another and option, yeah. Speeds it up. Yeah, another option that I sometimes use, if I'm using VirtualBox, it has checkpointing features. So you can checkpoint the virtual machine, you know, right when Parkman starts up. And then you resume it, it runs through, it does its thing, it doesn't work. So you resume it again, edit Parkman a little bit, and let it run through. Etc. And then you have a fairly tight loop there. You can even say "W get a file down," so you can have a file that you're pulling in every time. That's the one that you're editing. Something like that can be a little bit more sane. Uh, so, uh, a slightly different subject. I f often find uh, if doing actual testing on real machines, like you get stuck partway through and something doesn't work, you know, you're stuck in the, this didn't work so you can't go on and do the rest of it. Um, and you drop into, you know, so you're in the shell uh, and all you haven't got all your normal stuff. You haven't got proper apt or property package. You've got all the crazy mm -hmm. 
thingy. And mm -hmm. I've never found anywhere written down to tell me what I could actually do there. So <laughs> you go, I'm sure I could get myself out of here if I knew what to type. And it seems to be quite hard to discover. And maybe it's yeah. well documented now because this was a while back. But yeah, um, this is this file, which you have to know where it is, but it's in Debian installer utils source package, and it's the readme file. And that's all the, that's a lot of the interesting little bits and pieces that you can use to do good things um, in DI, such as install new UDEBs, or install DEBs into the target system, or, you know. So what was that called again, and where was it? That's okay. a useful fact. It is in the Debian installer utils source package, which you can just deb check out if you don't want the whole tree. Yeah. Um, we also have some other documentation. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is all uh, old and, you know, not really user level, um, but can be really helpful if you're developing. Uh, the environment, you just have to kind of learn, you know, it is a different environment, clearly. Because, I mean, I suspect I, people in the real world get stuck there quite often, and yeah. uh, we probably ought to make. I don't know if there's a wiki page saying, yeah, here's some stuff you can type which might get you out of a, yeah. of a stuck install. Yeah. Because it's usually some little piece that, you know, if you could just tell it to ignore that and carry on or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody wanted to know about preceding, if nobody else has an immediate thing. Um, who was that? Somebody here? Oh, okay. Okay. So maybe one thing it maybe one thing that is not widely known is where you can just find the standard preceding file because it's quite hard to just yeah. find which exact string you have to write. Well, you've seen the manual, right? <laughs> <laughs> Microphone, please. So one thing that would be useful is if you install a system manually, mm -hmm. and then somewhere <laughs> on that is the precede file that would recreate it. It is. It's it's on your laptop right now. Sweet. Um, <laughs> where, where, where on my laptop? It, it's. Uh, yeah, I don't actually know if it's on this machine because this wasn't installed with Debian installer because it's in a colo. Um, but yeah, you have a very long Debian installer, and it has the um, debconf templates. You can actually use that to dump out a precede file that has everything that you did during the installation, even. Okay, so um, something that needs uh, post processing. This is doc yeah, to. well, yeah, a little bit, but not right. much. It's it's actually documented in the manual um, how to dump this out and use it as your precede file okay. if you want to. Although you tend to have to edit it to remove garbage, you know. Cool. Yeah. Sorry, whereabouts is it again? I think um, it should be in log. slash var slash log slash Debian installer. Yeah, over here. Var log installer cdev. Oh, installer, yeah. Questions.dat and templates.dat. Yeah, I wish yeah, it was under, under there. Here, I'll put it over here. Why don't somebody put it, Garrett, why don't you put it on the uh, yeah. gobby? Put it on the gobby if you can. Joey. Yeah, hello. Hey. Um, <laughs> well, one, one thing is, you know, you have to enter uh, at the beginning of the I, the user configuration and all that, and that loads all the packages and installs the system. Do you think we could have an easy way to run Debian installer on an installed system so you can configure the user, keyboards, and all these right. parameters? That's There's like one, an, one OEM and an OEM configuration. Yeah, kind of. Right, and I think you have an answer next to you. Yeah. Well, then there's a second question. Well, let him answer. <laughs> I'm not going to answer. Okay, <laughs> we just have to go to the camera. Yeah. Well, in Ubuntu, there is package OEM config shipped, which does that, such that on first boot, it allows you to configure the system. But it, it for, it's part of Ubiquity, so you have to bring bring a lot of dependencies in, it's a, no? It's a wiki, it's quite, uh, it's quite mean. The answer is yes. And then. Sorry, yes, uh, OEM config is ubiquity, so that's what he's talking about. So, and then there is the question, you know, we had to drop support for uh, the slug because there was no enough RAM. Yeah. 
And uh, uh, should we start thinking on, on adding UCLIPC support, or is it not worth it? Or, or maybe I mean, you don't have an answer, but maybe the audience, or how do you feel about that? I think it would make it a lot harder to build DI just because of all the fairly complicated libraries all the way up to GTK that we use. Trying to build all that against UC libc seems difficult. Um, I'm always trying to find ways to make DI smaller though. And we have, I think, looked at UC libc or something like that before we just didn't get it to work. And of course we already do reduce libc down with make libs. But it does, every, the kernel is really the biggest problem we have as far as size, and we can't really do anything about it. It just keeps getting bigger. Every module is just 10 times what it was when we started DI. And it's sort of building our own size optimized kernel. I don't know what to do about that. I suspect that the uh, kernel is going to get larger, the kernel will get larger as well as the. Um there's signed, signed modules they're starting to add, and that adds a big chunk for each, for each module. Over there. Um, about the OEM, uh, I've been discussing this in private uh, with other Debian developers. <coughs> the idea we had is, what about creating a Debian installer image that you just put on the first partition with a preceding file that leaves out most of the questions, and that would even eventually protect itself by, I don't know, preceding partman to avoid uh, the user dropping this parti partition, and that could then stay as a rescue partition or, th or, or something. What, what amount of work would that mean? Well, My feeling is that almost everything we need is there. Just put it smartly. I mean, you could like you could start with Debian installer launcher again. It seems like the right thing to do because it can go directly from X into into DI already and run things and then jump right back into X even if you want. I, I would I think there's a lot of stuff in Debian Live that we could use that way. And I think they even already do a few um, OEM type configurations on boot in Debian Live, but I don't really know the details. I've just been using it this week, so <laughs> kind of getting a feel of it. I know there were some people who had specific detailed, I think you had some detailed thing, and I'd be happy to go into it if nobody else has any. I think one thing we had been struggling in the last weeks is how do others have good tips how to debug DIC code? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> except for Anna and main menu, which I could help you with, but not libdi. But yeah, nobody has already uh, put GDB into a DI image or whatever, yeah. run something on the wall grind or. Mm. I think people have actually, Colin's done it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know if, if there's a GDB UW I think you can actually just put it in, um, there's a way to pull in individual binaries as long as you have all the libraries available. So, um, eh, that's rather a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Python? Okay, well. <laughs> the Python extension to GDB is optional, so um, I check GDB minimal. Ah, yeah. Um, well, you can do it from the live session because then you can install anything you like and uh, then wrap around that somehow. Right. Yeah, you could do that, definitely. But that's not running the Debian installer the way you're going to end up running it. So if you can't reproduce it in live yeah, session, right. then you're <laughs> hmm. stuck. Where is it? Ah. This is actually, uh, might be an amusing thing to, uh. <laughs> You're feeling adventurous. 
It's a live image. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know what it did there. It's obviously booting up DI. There we go. Yeah. Um, I think this could be a usable development environment because you have this console yeah. and you have a full Debian in it. So, oh, I, you can't see this console, but I'm at the I'm at con VT number one, and I've got a full Debian system. I have DI right here, so you could GDB very easily that way. Yeah, that seems reasonable. Uh, how do you get out of here? Probably for for our specific case, <laughs> this does not run net config at all. Right. Because network is, is already available. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I got out of this before. Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe a question is what are the low hanging fruits that are pending in Debian and Stutter that could be tackled by someone in the SM, uh, in the audience? I mean, it's somehow hard also to see what is really what work is really needed. I mean, well, well, now we're in free, so the question is somehow unrelated. But I mean, there are probably things that could be sold in Debian and Stutter that just aren't because no one is doing their work, but that, that aren't necessarily hard. Yeah, and unfortunately, I'm a little out of touch, so somebody else will have to go for that. Did the did the flash support that was going into Partman ever get in and uh, therefore give us the ability to install to flash, which is something we've been missing? You're forever. talking about, um, uh, yeah. yeah. I don't think it did. Mm -hmm. I think Martin Micklemeyer was working on it, maybe. Uh, it was originally uh, um, uh, Blind BT, I've forgotten his name, a uh, Swedish guy, um, yeah. YGSOC yeah. student ages ago, and he did some work, but it, it didn't quite get into part man and then I think it just kind of fell on the floor really and mm -hmm. I think so. years later it still doesn't work but yeah yeah that, that would be a good definitely <laughs> so yeah that excludes a whole class of devices I mean actually it's less true than it was because people tend to have SD cards now right. so we care less but but embedded devices still really can use it yeah. um, uh, I was kind of wondering where would you get started for like uh, porting a new kernel or a new piece of hardware? Like getting like what what are the, the baby steps for getting a new port for DI? Again? Okay, is it a ARM port? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> random <laughs> guess. <laughs> um, there's a okay. There's libdi has like a table of ARM boards, like sub architecture names, and you have to get into there. And that way, and at that point, um, UD package dash dash sub architecture or something can tell the rest of DI what your board is. And from that point, it's mostly just a matter of hacking whatever bits of DI need to be specific to that board and then making actual boot images, which of course is always fun for ARM. Uh, <laughs> but it's generally, you know, you go into the Debian installer build system and find one that's sort of close and copy it and hack on it type thing. That's the general, I mean, it's not like you're copying the image, you're copying the build system. Hello. Um, we just added a new ARM platform, which is the DreamPlug device. Oh, yeah. And um, you just, just have to hack this Debian installer file and then within installer configs, ARM, just add what flavor you want to, to build and it's just, that's it. You just build the image and try to boot it. But of course you need to use the Debian, you, got, you have to use a Debian kernel because you pull yeah. from the network all the packages and then you have to install the Debian kernel. So first yeah. you have to work with mainline and get your platform supported in mainline. Once you got all these bits, then you can get it. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you can put any UDEBs that you like. There's a local UDEBs directory. Oh, but I mean, back to the inclusive. Uh, ah, right. There's the also a uh, package list slash local file that you can add UDEB names into, and then they go into your image. Yeah. yeah.
So was the outcome of that that there is an easy method to stick in a kernel of your choice? Because often you, it isn't upstreamed yet, but you'd quite like to get at least get DI working with I, this magic kernel you've got, and then right. you could you know, worry about the upstream part later. I wouldn't say easy. I mean, if it doesn't have any modules and it's just a monolithic kernel that happens to work with your hardware, then it's pretty easy because you just build a DI and you maybe leave out the kernel modules to save some space and you boot it with the kernel and it works. And so we can't just have kind of have arbitrary packages. So if, you know, if we've made a package with some, some, or a set of arbitrary files, you know, we can have a pile of lib modules, mm -hmm. blah, Mm -hmm. We can just dump that part in. Yeah, you just well, you have to make a UDEB out of it, but right. that's easy. Yeah. You know, make a, make a Debian package with you know your arbitrary files and. Okay, so we can do that, and that's yeah. written down somewhere. It's not mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you want to use a completely different kernel because you need some patches to actually boot or anything, you need to first package this as a Debian package and then to split out the UDEPs and potentially modify the, the lists kernel vetch uses. Um, yeah, I have not done this since kernel vetch somehow got merged into the kernel package, so I don't, I don't know the details. And there's this file list where you can say for this architecture use this on this kernel, you have eventually to modify that in the build system so the right packages get included into. So it's kind of complicated. I mean, I mean, it, it could probably be if you're easier and I think that would, would something would also be acceptable to have like a developer kernel option in the build system that mm. you could use in that case. One other thing we, uh, that could be added to the build system that is normally not very interesting is um, having firmware built in uh, because um, we try tend to test netboot images because it's the easiest way to build. But mm -hmm. usually if you, you don't netboot over wireless where you need firmware or if you need firmware, you probably can't netboot that card. Um, so it's mostly not needed in normal cir circumstances. Yeah. Uh. I usually just hack the build system to do that, but um, then I forget to have a proper patch to do it cleanly. There is a way to, there is an easy way to pull in firmware just by listing it in a file, but I forget where that is. There's uh, like an environment variable. It's easy to add the firmware to the init RD, but right. you have to add it before building the mini ISO if you then want to use the well, mini yeah, ISO. Yeah, but you can, you can just make it be pulled into the init RD directly from lib firmware at build time. That's already in the build system? Yeah, there's, a, okay. there's an environment variable, which unfortunately I'm forgetting the name of, but it's <laughs> basically a list of files to just pull off <coughs> your disk and shove into the DI or init RD in the same place. So okay. if you say lib firmware yeah. foo, there it is. Didn't know about that. Yeah, I unfortunately forget where it is, but I, it is documented somewhere. Well, as I'm sat here with this, uh, a kind of slightly off to an angle is whether we should look at, I mean, effectively DI is a way to make a little mini Debian for a specific purpose, and I wonder whether for you know, for the embedded Debian stuff, we should be considering what, how I is it craziness to try and use th this mechanism for slightly other purposes? You know, to what degree have we added all this machinery around it so it only makes installer images and it's not really suitable for making anything else? Mm -hmm. um, I don't really know whether this is a sensible route to ponder or look at or not. Really. So it seems to me like. Um, we have a bunch of other architectures for making other stuff. We have Debian Live. There's the deburf setup, which is for making uh, full Debian systems that run in the initial word MFS um, that you can customize. Um, it's got its clunkiness, but you can get anything from a, you know, a rescue CD in the initial word MFS. The init ramp stuff, is that pretty much a list of binaries to copy out? Is that how it works? The init ramp MFS is actually a, uh, it's a gzip CPIO archive. That's all it is, um, and you can you, <coughs> you can modify any any RAMFS in the same way that you would modify uh, 
another gzip CPIO archive. Just ungzip it, feed it through CPIO as a super user or under fake root, modify the files, stuff it back through CPIO, gzip it again, and it'll work. But aren't there a lot of hooks so that it knows, you know, packages that need to know and put files in the init ramps do the right thing? For yeah. init ramfs tools, there are a set of hooks. But in terms of what is an init ramfs, what are we working with? It's a very standard <coughs> form. And it doesn't need to be tiny. It only it needs to be as tiny as your memory is. Apart from ARM, where there are limits on how big your init ramfs is, and it's something like three meg, and then you're stuck. <laughs> if you're pulling your current your init ramfs off of the off of the onboard storage, no, I'm just saying that there there's other ways of getting an init ramfs onto a machine. So, um. in fact, uh, Grub Netboot is now functional for relatively large size init ramfs. Yeah, um, we, I sometimes wonder, you know, how long does it make sense to have a separate DI from Debian Live that, you know, has a completely different system that you have to learn all the quirks of and everything. But unfortunately, it does still seem to make sense because we have all the ARM systems, we have, you know, all the weird things like that that DI can support that you can't really support just running, you know, pieces of DI inside Debian Live type thing. Um, Colin and I have even talked about trying to use DI as the init ramfs uh, for Debian, because then you could say, you know, pull down SSH or something and have an SSH server in your init ramfs when you boot up if it can't mount through file system. You know, never quite got there to try to make it work. So given that we are slowly approaching to the end of the session, there's a question I see by Kibi, who will be the next DI release manager. Who will be? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so. If there are people interested in, I guess, forming a team or doing work, et cetera. Right. I think we need to find a way to get the DI team re-energized more than we are now, but it's obviously difficult because we're a mature project. What do you think? Well, one thing to maybe add is that it was certainly mega difficult in the past to hack on this because most of the bits were not done. And from nowadays, doing incremental patches to solve and to just scratch your itch is reasonably easy, I think, if you if you know how to package, I mean, UDEVs are just different type of packages, so, I mean, yeah, and then understanding the installer pro boot, uh, build process is not necessary as long as you just run the build and it just works, so, I mean, yeah, don't be afraid. <laughs> and yeah, I'm interested, but maybe after that comes 13. <laughs> <laughs> so, do we re do we need a DI release manager? Is it? I mean, the, the release team. I mean, why is DI special? I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. The the things that the DI release manager does comes down to coordinating not only the DI team as far as getting a coherent release out, which is basically what the release team does for Debian, but also chasing down everything in Debian that breaks that then breaks DI. You know, coordinating all of those things. It's, it's a lot of work still. So basically, the, given that Kiwi took it over, so Cyril uh, took it over from Otavio, um, more or less because Otavio was yeah, too busy, you can sort of consider that release team picked it up. I mean, he even said it on IFC now. So that's not the ideal situation. You would want to have somebody really know the internals of DI and working on it specifically and on its goals specifically than just the overall picture release team view.
So um, I think now might be a good time to actually get into, I forget your name, your, your difficult questions so we can scare the rest of the room a little bit. Right. If you want to so Partman LVM does not currently live, uh, if you use guided uh, partitioning or manual as far as I understand, it cannot leave free disk space in the physical, uh, well, in the in volume the group, yeah. such that you can't have any snapshots or resize or move your right. LVM partitions after you run the installer. And the other thing, well, side question, which is I think is, has less usage. If you use guided LVM, it, it cannot leave any free disk space at all on the actual your hard disk, such that you can't have something else left after it for you know dual booting or whatever. No. So the uh, the the sort of maybe brain dead workaround for that is to include in your precede a demand for a large volume named delete me, um, and yes. then when you're done, you just delete the. And uh, that's what uh, Edu Debian is doing right now. And there is a bug report saying, we would like to drop this. Yeah. <laughs> Please do something. So you want to work on this, I take it. Well, yeah, or you at could, least yeah. poke around the yeah. department to show yeah. what needs to be changing. Because as far as I understand, it's the department who doesn't support the leave this space free, even though yeah. I have created it somehow or whatever. Right. Whereabouts it'll, would that be? It'll be, it'll be in Partman Auto. Um, Unfortunately, Partman Auto is not the part of Partman that I know very well, and I don't know that I know Partman that well. Uh, have a try. Yeah, I mean, you have all these recipes, right? And <laughs> they're some complicated thing. <laughs> you have to add, it's basically a little language. You have to find some way to add your feature in. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, where is it? Uh, So this is the little weird, completely weird and unspecified language, which needs to be replaced with something else, really, that makes sense. Uh, well, it made sense 20 I, years ago. Basically, the way this works, as I understand it, which isn't very well, is that Partman, you can think of it as an object-oriented system, but it's not really, of course. But so these are all, you know, all the object properties are little files on disk in this directory. And this is tweaking attributes of the objects to make Partman behave the way it wants it to. Um, I think that's the correct high-level view of how this works right now. Um, and so it's going through, you know, just setting up different objects for different file systems with various attributes, like how they're formatted, if they're a swap partition. <coughs> so you need a way to have some kind of reserved, I don't know, Either a reserved object that's never actually created might be one way to do it, or something. <laughs> or go in and actually modify the core logic that lays these out would be the other way, I guess. It's like what you want is the VG should take the whole space, yet from your multi-scheme, you don't want your root partition or the biggest one to take the biggest amount. You want it to be something else. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, yeah, these numbers are how it figures out you know the space right now. So you, I think one way would just be to add like uh, you know something like that. Yeah. <laughs> no idea. It's just you know something along those lines. But this is the part of part man that. I'd say the least people so understand well. Is, is that the part that also gives you the default sizes we get at the moment? Yes. Because they're, they're yes. looking a bit old, too. Uh, we know how to tweak those, and we do tweak them from time to time. Right. But as far as tweaking much more of this, it gets a little hairy. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, I have exactly the same problem as yeah. this, is that you yeah. always want to make with a blank space. That's kind of the whole point, and, yeah. and it doesn't work. The other question about this magical variables, which they're not very nice considering that we have really large disks right now, because mm -hmm. the way you could do it, you have some you know, magical factors involved. Because if you say 80% on a 10 terabyte disk, you really want it to leave, for example, 200 gig remaining. 
if you have a tiny small disk yeah. and SD card yeah, of yeah. 8 gig, you really want to leave just 200 you, you, meg or whatever, 20% Yeah, you, you really want some conditionals in this little micro language so you can... Yeah, well, one ideal solution I saw is that you dynamically adjust what 80% means depending on how large your disk is using a formula and a magical magical factor. It's actually called magic factor such that you even it out as your disk grows to make it smaller okay. such that it becomes nonlinear but that's what you want in okay. cases where you have fairly small and very large systems. That's a, method. that's a mathematical idealistic answer, but yeah, whether practically it's implementable. Oh, oh, you have to be able to do it in Exper, in Bash, in, um, in BusyBox shell. <laughs> oh, of, co of course, of course, of course. Natural. I thought you would argue to write it in Haskell and ship the binary. No, I, I'm not going to go there. Uh, maybe an another thing to add is, as UDEBs are exactly like Debian packages for most of the, uh, their ap aspects, one can perfectly upload them to experimental during the freeze if there are new things that, I don't know, the Ubuntu would like to test in Debian first. I mean, we have this experimental that still works, that still builds on all our arch architectures, and then you can even, and even give in small trickery build Debian installer images from UDEBs from experimental, although I don't think that's implemented yet, it should work. Yeah, or it absolutely. Could be. And yeah. it's, I mean, uh, being able to um, take UDEBs partly from experimental is also in the ground picture of what would be ideal for Debian inst installer, so if you implement that, it would be welcome, I guess. I think you can actually do it just by going in here to sources.list.udev and putting an experimental line in, and then it should, I don't know about pinning and how that's going to work, but you might be able to, you know. <laughs> yeah. You probably have to adjust the pinning so it yeah. works, yeah. Um, and there was this question about what uh, kind of areas that need work or where the cool new features could be added. Um, uh, I, one problem I see with this, uh, I don't know a good solution, is that many missing features um, I know of currently are things that need uh, quite a complicated setup so you can test them. Like um, if we want to have enterprise WPA um, supported in the installer, you need a test environment that actually has radius and everything to test it. Or a bit, little bit um, less complicated thing if you want VLANs configured in network, you need at least a VLAN capable switch or some OPOWT device that can do VLAN tagging uh, or um, IPv6 is similar. Um, yeah, disk things may be similar. I think I recently saw a new report of this group install installs to the actual installation USB stick instead of the real hard disk that's something that Apparently, it still happens, but nobody yeah. knows why or I don't think so. because um, it just happens on that certain device. That's really hard to debug. Yeah. But again, um, don't forget that the Debian installer, despite the fact that you see it only once in the life of one computer, supposedly, is still uh, a piece of software that is very much Debian specific and has, can in well, it's an area in which you can have a huge Im impact in terms of translations, in terms of whatever else, uh, tiny functionality that just allows you to install Debian from a campaign or whatever. <laughs> so you were talking about mysterious failures on you know somebody's machine. Presumably, we have kind of some kind of logging we get from. Is there logging by default? It's just that var log, whatever it, it is. Right, file, it basically. depends on whether the user sends an installation report. We don't do automatic reporting back type logging. No. So they have to actually do that and then they have to actually select the logs because unfortunately the BTS kind of dislikes enormous logs. So, so is there a kind a of problem. report bug DI feature that yeah. helps with that, right? There's a report bug installation report that does everything, yeah. And I think we're pretty much out of time. This was pretty productive. I hope that it's gotten a few people interested in working on DI. It'd be great if you did. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.